Hello, this is CJ Hoyle. Today is Saturday, May the 1st, 2021, and I'm standing here at the intersection of DuPont and Lansdowne Avenue here in Toronto. Today I'm riding my linear limo recumbent bike, which as you can see has an action camera mounted on the front of it. And in this video I'm going to be riding a route of Toronto streets and attempting to write the number 30,000 to celebrate achieving 30,000 subscribers here on my CJ Hoyle YouTube channel. Alright, so here I'm pressing start on Strava and we'll get on the road and we'll begin our way heading in the east direction along DuPont here. And I'm planning on doing this in one continuous ride without any stops along the way. I should say this is not an entirely new original idea. There's actually a it's actually an activity called Strava Art, where you draw things on the map while you're doing an activity. There have been many much more artistic Strava Arts than what I'm attempting in this video here. You know, people like to draw, you know, symbols and pictures of animals and things like that. Let me just tilt the camera up a little bit so you can see a little bit more than just the pavement. And while I'm riding along here, you can see on the side of the screen, I've got a split screen which shows the map. So you should be able to follow my progress as I'm working my way along here. It's relatively cold today and kind of a little bit windy, but nice blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. It's nice and warm in the sunshine. Well, not warm, but certainly not warm for May 1st. So we're just passing the Galleria Mall over here on the right, and this next intersection up ahead is for DuPont and Dufferin Street is the one that it intersects with, and this is where I'm going to make my first turn. I'm going to turn right and start heading south. And basically what I've done so far is the very first stroke of the number three in the 30,000. I'll be working on drawing most of the three first, and then I'll be going and doing all those zeros after it. So I'll be going down south along Dufferin Street here. I've never made a video on Dufferin before. It's not particularly known for being a place that people like to go cycling on. So this is Hallam that we're crossing here. And Hallam is an east-west street that runs parallel to DuPont and parallel to Bloor, sort of halfway in between. And it's quite a common cycling route for getting east-west. That's normally what I would take to get from where I am over in the annex to where I started the video today over in at Lansdowne. That's the route that I actually took today. And Hallam connects up with another street which is runs in the same direction. They don't quite align with one another, but they're pretty close. The other one's called Lappin. All right, so here's Wallace Avenue. So I'm gonna make a right turn here and I'm gonna make the next portion of the number three. And I'm actually gonna be, once I get back to Lansdowne here along Wallace, I am gonna be doing a U-turn and continuing back in the opposite direction along Wallace. This should be the only part in the video where I'll need to backtrack. Just the way that the number three is, there are those three little sticks that kind of need to be done independently. I don't think I've ever ridden this portion of Wallace before. 
can see there's that water tower or some kind of a tank that's straight ahead. I'm thinking that must be along above one of the old factories that goes beside the, the train tracks up that way. I'm not entirely sure. And you'll see that I am making a full stop at all these stop signs, which is the law. Although you don't see everybody following that law, motorists and cyclists included in that, coming to a full stop. Yeah, one of the cool things about this video should be that you'll get to see a lot of streets that I've never covered before and that you wouldn't really normally necessarily see. Just the streets that happen to fall in the spots that form the parts of the numbers that I'm trying to draw here. All right, so here I am at Lansdowne, so I'm gonna make my one and only U-turn in this video. I'm just gonna stand up and walk my bike around here. All right, so now I'm heading east again, back to Dufferin. We've got all those stop signs to go through again. This route also will go through a number of one-way streets, and there's a lot of streets throughout these neighborhoods which are reversing one way, so you know, you'll, this is a perfect example of it right here. You can see that the right, the road to the right is going north, and the road to the south is a one-way going south. Sorry, the road to the left is a one-way going south, which means that you can't continuously go along that street. You have to, you know, turn, whether you're going north or whether you're going south on it. So the way that I'm gonna handle those on my bike is I'm just gonna get off and walk on the sidewalk to get through them. Because of course, if I took the actual route that you know they had really intended that you would take, then it's not gonna draw the kind of shapes that I'm looking for and I'm not gonna ride the wrong way on a, on a one-way street. This is Brock Avenue that we're crossing and the, street, the school over on the right is St. Sebastian Catholic School. Stop sign at Pauline Ave and continue. And we're almost back to Dufferin where we'll continue our way heading south. The top and bottom of the numbers are going to be DuPont at the top and Bluer at the bottom. And I spent quite a bit of time looking at the different streets, you know, in Toronto to find the ones that were the, would be the best for, for doing this. I was kind of envisioning I'd be able to find a, a shorter route than this, you know, something that would be maybe about five kilometers, you know, just very short little blocks, but I really couldn't find one, at least nothing that was close to home for me. So I think the total distance of this ride, or at least of the filmed part of this ride, will be nearly, I think almost 17 kilometers. That's typically longer than I show in my, in my YouTube videos. But I figured given this is sort of a milestone, 30,000, it would be one that the people that have been following me for a while might wanna watch and may not appeal to everybody, but that's okay. All right, so continuing my way along Dufferin here. All the way down to Bluer. So when I get to Bluer, instead of turning right to draw the bottom part of the three, I'm actually gonna turn left 
and I'm gonna leave that portion until the very end because I'm gonna finish the ride off by riding all the way along Bloor. So I'm actually gonna be turning left here. So we've mostly completed the three so far. We've gotten kind of one, two, three, three of the segments of the three are finished, but the, the last one will need to wait until the very end of the video. And obviously you'll see what I mean once I get there. So here we are, Bluer West, turning to the left, waiting our turn. And Bluer does have bike lanes now, which is pretty nice. Again, you'll be getting to see a little portion of that here and more of it later on. And actually, I'm just seeing there is a, a left turn restriction. I really shouldn't be doing this right now. Usually those left turn restrictions are Monday to Friday, but that one actually said Monday to Saturday. So I guess I should have done that as a, a two stage left. All right, so Gladstone is the one that I'm gonna go north on here. And I believe that's this first street that you can see right here over on the left. Gotta make sure. Yeah, Gladstone, okay. So I'm gonna get past these parked cars here and turn to the left and we've got our first portion of of walking instead of biking, so I'll wait my turn here now to cross again. Maybe I should have just, you know, taken the sidewalk. I'll have to consider that for my next time that I do my portions on Bluer, where I have to turn left. Quite a bit of traffic coming. I should mention, I've never done Strava art before. <laughs> this is my first time attempting this. And I'm doing it on video, which obviously makes it a little bit more challenging. So we just get off my bike here and I'll walk along. I'll walk along this sidewalk here. I'm trying to keep my lines as straight as possible. Because <laughs> I figure the straighter they are, the more it will look like an actual number. So yeah, this is Gladstone. Gladstone is a northwest uh, north-south street that runs from, I think all the way, starts down at, at uh, Queen Street, so goes all the way from Queen up to DuPont. It might even go further than that. And this is another one of those reversing one-way streets. So right now I'll be, you know, right now I'm walking, but up ahead it will reverse directions, I believe, which should enable me to get on my bike and ride for a a couple blocks and then I'll have to probably walk again. We'll, we'll see. So yeah, now we're starting on the first of the four zeros. I guess we should try and keep the bike upright so that the image is not tilted. It's a little bit easier to push my bike when it's sideways. So this neighborhood here is, I believe, known as Dovercourt Park. And that's because it's sort of centered around a park that's called Dovercourt Park. Dovercourt is the name of a, a street that runs north-south. That's in between Dufferin and Ossington. While I'm walking here, I'm going to take a look at my phone and make sure that I'm on track the way that I should be. And everything looks good on Strava so far. Strava is the app that I use for recording the GPS with my phone. Let's just check my route plan and yep, I'm on the right track. So we're gonna go up to DuPont again, and then we're gonna turn right at DuPont and all the way to past Dovercourt to a street called Concord, I think. <laughs> the way that I have my route set up on my phone, it the lines on the map sort of cover the names. So it's kind of hard to see what they're called, but it's kind of two streets past 
Dover Court, and it's called Concord, I think. And then I'll come south again, and that will finish most of this first zero. So yeah, as I'm doing this, I will periodically have to be checking these things to make sure I'm on the right track. The way that I normally would uh, sort of follow a route like this would be by using my Garmin GPS on my phone, or sorry, Garmin GPS standalone device that I have, and I have a bracket that would mount it onto the front of my bike so I can kind of follow it, but the little mount thing that I have on my bike that usually holds that bracket actually broke uh, not, not too long ago. And I'm, you know, it's obviously fixable, but I haven't gotten around to fixing it yet. That would have made things a little bit easier today, but with these portions of walking, you know, it's not really that hard to look at a device while you're walking. So yeah, we're getting to ride north again, and you can see there is a do not enter sign over there in the distance, which we'll have to respect and do a little bit more walking, but this nice long section here in the middle allowed us to ride. And here we are about to cross Hallam Street again. I'll just ride across the intersection and we'll get back on the sidewalk and walk this one last short block up to DuPont. So yeah, most of the videos that I've been filming lately have been narrated bike riding videos like this, but most of them have been focusing on streets that don't have bike infrastructure on them. And that's because with the pandemic and the stay at home order in place, there are fewer places for people to drive, fewer cars on the road it seems, which makes these places that I would normally not want to touch with a 10 foot pole when riding my bike, uh, a lot more appealing for for riding on, or not, not necessarily more appealing, but it's just sort of a unique opportunity to get to see them in their lower traffic volume state. So I've been filming videos on those streets. But the video that I filmed last week was actually in a park that was up at uh, Cedarvale Park, which is a park that I cross-country skied through back in February. And I then revisited the same park, the same trail, the same route, uh, this time riding my bike instead. And this time with it being no longer winter, no longer snowy, it had uh, cherry blossoms were, were out and about, which was a nice feature to be able to see in a, in a video. They only last for about a week or so. And they do vary, you know, one tree to another across the city, across different places. They will bloom at different times. And there still are some that are blooming around that you'll, you'll be seeing in this video. All right, so here we are at DuPont. So we've got the first segment of the zero now filmed. Now I'll get back on the road and I'll ride in the east direction and I'll get to draw the next part of the zero, the top part. Of course, I'll get to ride here for a while again. 
heading in the east direction along DuPont. And we're going to go, like I said, to a street called Concord, which is after Dover Court but before Ossington. And even though, like I said earlier, the traffic volumes seem to be lighter right now, a street like this on DuPont is still not a street that I would particularly choose to ride on. I remember from my, my DuPont video that this building over on the left which has all that glass that used to be a big factory that made mechanical things like gears and they made some of the mechanisms that were used in the St. Lawrence Seaway. That building is now listed for lease. It hasn't been used as a factory for quite a long time from what I understand. Alright, so we're looking for our second street on the right to turn and head in the south direction and hopefully I don't overshoot it. So yeah, Delaware Avenue was the first one, which I'm not going to take. And yeah, Concord Avenue, here it is. So I'll turn to the right here. And we'll begin our way heading south. And it's a, it's a one-way street, but it's one way in the right direction for our purposes. So I'll get to ride down this. And now I'm, so I've got the first two segments of the zero completed. And now I'm working on that third one. So I've got lots of ideas for for future videos to make. Here we are at Hallam Street again. I'll make my full stop and I'll make a crossing here. Wait my turn. This is not a four-way stop, it's just a, a two-way stop, is that what you call it? <laughs> Where there's only a stop in the crossing directions. So yeah, in terms of videos that I'm hoping to make in the coming weeks and months, um, so I recently bought a kayak, a very short, small, it's actually a white water kayak, but I'm not really planning on using it for white water. I really just chose it because it's nice and short. And I'm planning on using it primarily for paddling in and around the water here right in Toronto, including down at the waterfront in Lake Ontario, as well as some of our rivers and creeks and things that we have around the city. And of course I'm planning on making adventure videos about those, you know, those adventures that I take on the kayak. I'm planning on sharing some of those in my videos. I, I took that kayak out for its maiden voyage, or at least its maiden voyage. For me, as an owner of it, it's, it's not a new kayak. It's, it was made in 1999, but new to me and in great condition. But I took it for its first paddle done by me uh, last Saturday, and I absolutely loved it. So in the future, I do hope that I will be able to show, first of all, show off the kayak as well as the trailer that I use for, for towing it because I, I am a car-free person. I don't, I don't have a, 
a vehicle other than my bikes. So when I want to transport something, I have to be a little bit more creative about it. And the way that I do that is, the way that I transport this particular item is a, a bike trailer. So yeah, looking forward to, to showing that. I kind of want to, I've, I've watched a lot of videos online of, uh, you know, people showing, you know, their kayak or their canoe trailers that they built. And you can tell that they're always filming them, like right after they just finished it. Like they've just, they're still like working on finishing it. They haven't even really used the thing. And I don't really want to do that because I have a feeling that a lot of those trailers that people have shown are like, this is how it's supposed to work. They're just sort of, you know, they're hoping it's going to work, but they're not really sure. So I don't really want to film it, fil film and sort of share my, my design or my, my modifications with the world until I'm confident that they're really going to, that they really work well. Because if, you know, a week later after I publish the video, something significant on it breaks and I end up redesigning the whole thing, well that's not going to be, you know, the people that watched my original video are going to follow the advice from the first video, which probably isn't correct. So I kind of want to make sure my design has been tested thoroughly before I share it with the world. And I mean, I have used it once. I mean, I used it last weekend to get the kayak down and it did work well, but yeah, I want to get a couple of, a couple more reps in there before I, before I'm ready to share it. So yeah, we're on Bluer now. We finished the first three segments of that first zero. Now we're gonna work on the next zero, the first segment of that. And like I said, the bottom segment of all the numbers will be done at the very end of the video. So I've gone one block over on Bluer and I'm gonna come north along Ossington now. And let me just double check before I go any further to make sure that I'm I'm on the right track, but I'm I'm pretty sure Ossington is the, the correct street. And it is, okay, so we'll head north along Ossington. So I made a video about a year ago showing Ossington riding it from end to end. It starts up at Davenport and it goes as far south as Queen Street. It dead ends there. It dead ends at KMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And there's a dead raccoon on the street there. <laughs> so yeah, kayaking videos around Toronto. There's a lot of cool things that you get to see if you're in a watercraft that you wouldn't otherwise get to see just from seeing on seeing it on the land like I've made videos in the past where I've ridden my bike all the way along the waterfront and I've made videos where I've ridden my bike over on Toronto Island but from the water you get to see those places from different angles and there's sort of just extra places that you don't otherwise get to see from the land that I'm hoping to share. For example, last weekend I was paddling at Ontario Place, which is an old children's amusement park, among other things. And it's kind of a series of man-made islands that are connected together with bridges and sort of buildings that are suspended up above the water and stuff. And, you know, I've been there a number of times as a kid and as an adult, just sort of wandering around there on my bike. But getting to paddle there in the kayak last weekend, I got to see all kinds of parts of it and different angles of looking at things that I'd never seen before. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of those adventures once I kind of get the hang out of filming while paddling a kayak. One of the challenges that I was finding with it when I was paddling and sort of making, I wasn't making a video last weekend, I was just paddling around and occasionally taking some photos. 
and I found that because it's a, a white water kayak, which has, you know, no keel on the bottom that keeps it going straight and, you know, no rudder or any other kind of thing like that, whenever you would stop paddling, the kayak would just, you know, spin in a different direction. It would, you know, like you'd be paddling and it would almost like do a 180 just as soon as you stop paddling just because there's nothing to keep it pointing in that direction. So, you know, that would make it challenging for making a video. I mean, I have to find some way of sort of holding the camera steady while I'm doing that. So we're back up here at DuPont and I'm gonna turn right and head my way over to the next street where I'll be going south, which is called Christie. There's a police car, I'll just pull over. I was really expecting today the streets would be really calm, but there are a lot more cars than I was anticipating. building over on the left, the big red brick one, that used to be a building that, well that was a building that was built by the Ford Motor Company and they used to build Model T Fords in that, in that building and it used to be the showroom and everything too. All right, so turning right here at Christie, we'll head south again, finishing off this second zero. So yeah, in addition to continuing making bike riding videos and hopefully also making some kayaking videos, I really would like to do some travel this summer. In the past, I used to spend all my, almost all my vacation days in a year doing multi-day bike trip series where I would sort of do, you know, a nine day trip or a 10 day trip, riding my bike somewhere and camping along the way. Unfortunately, last summer I didn't, get, I didn't get to do any trips like that. And really it's the, it's the pandemic that makes that kind of travel really difficult because campgrounds are just a completely different equation with things in their current state. There's been a huge spike in people making reservations for, for camping, which means that when you want to go and camp somewhere, the provincial parks need to be like booked well in advance if you want to get a spot. And a lot of the private campgrounds, at least last year when I was researching them, they weren't open to people that were wanting to stay there and sleep in a tent. They were really only, at least from, again, most of the ones that I looked into, a lot of them were only offering accommodation or, you know, camping for people who had a vehicle that had its own bathroom because they didn't want to have to worry about, you know, dealing with all the sanitary things with a washroom, or I don't exactly know what their restrictions and things were, but that was the result that you couldn't really 
a lot of the, you know, whenever I was looking into a trip of going somewhere, I'd look up all the campgrounds in an area and they would all say something along those lines, or even they would just be all booked up too. So it really makes doing a bike trip, at least in the way that I've done them in the past, you know, nearly impossible. But I'm optimistic that something might be, you know, something might be possible. So I'm not entirely ruling it out, but at this point, I'm not exactly sure. I'm just going to get off my bike here and I'm going to walk on the sidewalk because this is bluer. And again, I'm going to be turning to the left and working on the next zero here. And like I, like I found at that first sort of turn that I made at Bloor, it's pretty, pretty difficult to do. See, I just found that it worked better if I sort of walked and I figured that with the way that Christie is, the street actually kind of diverts a little bit over to the right, which means that my zero wouldn't be perfectly straight. So by walking here, I'm gonna get a, a more straight zero. So yeah, not entirely ruling out a, uh, a bike trip series. But uh, I can't guarantee one either. But what I am hoping to do is to do another sort of canoe trip like I did last year where I, last year I did a, a big long segment of the, the Trent Severn Waterway, which I really enjoyed. And the reason that was possible, but a bike trip wasn't, was because the lock stations along the canal, along the waterway, allow camping exclusively to people who arrive there uh, by water. So if you arrived on a boat, then they would allow you to be able to camp there on a first come first serve basis and in my experience most nights I was the only person camping there a couple times there was maybe one other tent but usually I was the only one camping there so there's really no fear of them being like overflow and not allowing you to camp so that ended up working really well for uh, for that kind of a trip I should mention as well, for, for my, you know, when you're doing a, a trip like, like I do, you know, sort of a human powered kind of a trip where you're either, you know, riding your bike from A to B, or, oh, I guess this is a, I thought that was a one way, but I am actually allowed to, to drive on this or ride on this. <laughs> when you're doing a human powered sort of a trip where you have to get a certain distance each day, there are always factors and variables that could, you know, could slow you down. Like it could be, um, you know, it could be something as simple as a mechanical breakdown when you're when you're riding your bike. Like I've had problems with my my cargo rack is broken, or you know, a flat tire, or you know, something that's pretty significant that you can't just easily fix, and it really slows you down, or it even makes you need to change your plans. You really just can't guarantee that you're going to be able to get from A to B every day. You have to be kind of flexible to make it work. So even if it was possible to sort of, you know, set up a series of reservations at all the, all the campgrounds that I want to go to, you know, there would be some concern that something like that could happen. And then as soon as you like, let's say the second day of your trip, you end up having to, you know, delay and you don't get to your, your destination. Well, all the subsequent days are going to be like a day behind and then all your reservations are going to be sort of useless to you. So really it works best. I prefer to not make reservations. I prefer to camp or stay at places that have, you know, ample space 
and uh, you know you just you just have the flexibility to arrive when you need to and do what you want. Okay, this is a really interesting house here on Clinton. See this uh, minivan over on the left? It's been all decorated up with shells. You can see the house that goes with it over on the over on the right. Uh, very elaborate and special. It's one of the things I love about Toronto that you just you know there's little hidden gems like that all over the place where people have done very unique and interesting things to their homes. So yeah, we've got this little section here of one way, but we should be able to ride again up ahead. And we're now working on the third of the four zeros in the 30,000. So yeah, like I was saying, I really do hope to do another trip that's kind of similar to the one that I did on the Trent Severn waterway. Um, the waterway that I have in mind right now is the Rideau Canal from Kingston to Ottawa. I don't have a, a week nailed down right now or anything like that. And the, the uh, Parks Canada has announced that, you know, the dates that everything will be open. And it seems like they're, they're planning on having the same sort of setup as last year where camping is available at lock stations the same way it was last year. But, you know, we're currently in a stay at home order right now, which means, you know, you're really not supposed to travel for anything that's not essential. I mean, right now I'm out getting my exercise, but certainly not a time when you'd be allowed to go on vacation. And it's really hard to know, you know, later in the summer what What restrictions might be in place. We really hope that, you know, things will be open this summer, but it's really not something that can be planned too far in advance. I would say that's one of my most frequently asked questions here on YouTube though, is sort of asking me what my future plans are for videos or travel or, or whatever. It's something that I kind of prefer to not answer or not really talk about a lot in videos and the reason is just because it's really hard to predict the future and if you say you're going to make a, a certain video about a certain thing and then you end up changing your mind for whatever reason then you know it's can be kind of disappointing <laughs> if you're, you're you know someone's looking forward to something and it doesn't come or it comes later than they're expecting. So once again, we're on DuPont, working our way over, working on this third zero here. And I'm gonna go past Bathurst Street to the next street, which is called Albany or Albany. So that neighborhood we were just coming through there, that's known as the Seton Village neighborhood. And once we get past Bathurst here, we'll now be in a neighborhood known as the Annex. And it's called that because back in the early years, or at least that during one period of time, Toronto only went as far north as Bluer. And when they added this part of, you know, part of land that's north of Bluer to Toronto, it was annexed. It was annexed by the, the city of Toronto. Although most of the land, you know, all the land north of Bluer was eventually annexed, so 
From that perspective, anything north of Blue Earth could be known as the Annex. All right, here is Albany, so we're gonna make a right turn and it's a one way, so I'm gonna be walking once again. I'm gonna choose this sidewalk over here on the east side. That's because Albany is kind of a, doesn't perfectly line up. It's not perfectly straight, but by going on this side, on this portion and going on the other side for the next portion, I should be able to get the straightest line possible for this third segment of the third zero. So yeah, it's really nice here in the sun. Yesterday was a really windy kind of stormy day. And before that, we had an awful lot of rain this past week. So it's nice, nice day to be out doing this. I had some ambitions of going kayaking this morning. But uh, there was actually a frost advisory in effect last night, so it, you know, dropped down below or at least very close to zero degrees Celsius. And when I left home this morning to make this video, it was about six degrees Celsius. So certainly was not warm and the water in the lake right now is also very cold. It's, uh, I read somewhere last weekend when I was out that it was about four degrees Celsius. So just a little bit above freezing that converts to about, I think about 60 degrees. No, not 60, I think 50 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Maybe even 40. <laughs> I should, I'll put, I'll put the actual conversion up here on the screen. And uh, you know, that's dangerously cold. <laughs> you know, the sort of temperature that if you were to fall in, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to last for very long before you got hyperthermia. So. While it's still this cold in the in the lake, I've been really careful, you know, with where I, where exactly I paddle. I'm always conscious of being very close to shore. And of course I wear my PFD or my life jacket so that, you know, I'll, I'll stay afloat. But, you know, I try and stay like less than 10 meters away from shore so that I can, could swim to, to save myself if I needed to. So that sort of rules out, you know, going over to Toronto Island or, or doing things like that. But there's lots of stuff, you know, close to shore that you can still see that I've, that I'm looking forward to seeing while it's, you know, still cold. All right, so here is where Alvin, Albany takes its sort of little jog to the east. And this is what I meant. So by going on that sidewalk for that portion, it should give me a little bit more of a straight line for my zero here. So I'll just get back on my bike and we've got one segment of Albany here that's one way in the favorable direction, but it does switch again after a block. That street back there is called Wells. The street really does need to get repaved. It's pretty bumpy, but hopefully with the image stabilization on this camera, you won't really notice it that much. All right, so here's Barton Avenue where I have a stop sign and I'll get off my bike and I'll walk from here back down to Bloor.
And as I'm coming along here, I'll point out the former home of Jane Jacobs, who was a Toronto activist who did a lot of great things, including that's her red brick house right there. That's Jane Jacobs' home, former home. And one of the things she did was to stop the um, Spadina Expressway, which essentially you've got the Allen Expressway, which sort of cuts through the middle of the streets that are north of Eglinton, uh, kind of what, what's where the, the uh, subway runs from Eglinton West north from there. And there was a plan to sort of have a, a highway that would cut south from there that would go all the way kind of through the middle of downtown through a bunch of nice neighborhoods and other areas. I don't know a lot about this. This, this happened back in the 60s or 70s. But that uh, project was stopped and she was part of that. And there's an event that happens in Toronto and lots of other places around the world called Jane's Walks. Uh, actually, I think this is the weekend, the first weekend in May. It could be the first weekend in June, I'm not sure. But it's a weekend where um, people lead uh, walks around the city to share information. So, you know, historic, there could be a, you know, a historical walk where someone walks around a neighborhood and they tell the history of the neighborhood and, you know, where this thing came from and how this got its name and, you know, the history of this one building or whatever. They just, it's, it's a very interesting history walk. Uh, but they're not all history. Like there's, there's different, different topics too. I know that uh, there's one, for example, that was about accessibility and it was led by, you know, an accessibility advocate who, you know, was educating and sort of giving people the experience of what it would be like to go through a neighborhood in a wheelchair or, you know, something like that to, to share that. So, yeah, Jane's Walks are a, a neat event that were named after Jane Jacobs. As far as I know, she didn't invent them or create them. Or, you know, she had no, in, no involvement with the actual organization. They were just sort of named after her. All right, so we're almost down here at Bluer. This is the portion of Bluer that's known as the Bluer Annex. And once again, we'll make a left turn and then we'll be going up another street called Howland. I think that probably will be the last one that I'll have to walk down. I think from there on, we've got all, all streets that are two-way and favorable for us. So we finished the third segment now of the third zero and we're now gonna be working on our fourth zero before we come back along Bluer and make that bottom stroke that we're, we're missing. Yeah, it really is a nice day to be out here for this ride and walk. <laughs> and yeah, we've got a one way here, but it's for this first segment here, it's in the right direction for us. Let's get on my bike. I'll begin my way up. So yeah, I hope you're enjoying getting to see these streets that, you know, don't really get featured in my videos normally, just sort of neighborhood residential streets. There's certainly lots of those here in Toronto with 
a lot of old houses, a lot of very big houses in this area. I mean, big houses for for downtown from a downtown perspective. All of the, a lot of these lots are very long and thin, so the fronts of these houses may not be that impressive, but they go back pretty far, and most of them are three-story houses. All right, there's my stop sign. Now I will walk for this one-way portion here after I cross Barton again. There's a park over to the left called St. Albans Square. And there's a big church there over on the left. And next to it, there's a, a school. At the moment, I'm blanking on the names of those, but I think I'll see the names in a second after, I, after we pass them, or as we're passing them. I think the church is actually part of the school, at least it is now. So, Cathedral of St. Alban the Martyr. That's the name of the ch church, or the cathedral, and the school is called Royal St. George College, or Royal St. George's College and it's a, a private school. So I guess this is probably the first walking video that I've ever made. Although I'm walking my bike, so I don't know if that really counts as a walking video, and most of the video is actually not walking, it's mostly riding. Here you can see some blossoms coming up over on the, on the right that we'll get to walk right past. I think those ones are cherry blossoms, kind of a pink color. Lots of these houses don't really have front lawns, they have gardens as their entire front lawn instead. And the next segment of Howland is also a one way in the wrong direction, so we'll be walking one more block up to DuPont and then like I said, I think it should all be bike riding from there again. See the tulips are out. They're a, I'm sure, most, I'm sure most people know what tulips are, but they're a, a perennial flower that is a bulb. It has a part of the plant that just stays in the ground all year round. And in the spring it grows into a stalk and there's a flower on it. and. By the end of the year, it sort of dies off, but the, the bulb stays there in the ground, and the next year it just sprouts out of that same bulb again. Most of these houses are pretty old, like, you know, around 100 years old, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit newer. But occasionally you'll see one that's either been, you know, significantly renovated where they've kind of made it look, you know, they've sort of sort of replaced the front of it, the front facade, or they've, they've altered it pretty significantly, or sometimes they'll even completely tear down the old building and build a new one in its place. But it's a very nice area to come walking in. I really enjoy this. I live in this neighborhood, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I find it a really nice place to go, go walking. 
And I just find that, you know, when, when you're on a walk around the neighborhood, you're looking at the houses and, and things, and there are hundreds of them that you'll see, you know, in the neighborhood, and each time you'll kind of, you might notice a different one that you've never sort of noticed before, and like, oh yeah, you know, did you notice how that roof kind of sticks out funny, or, you know, things like that. It just, unlike sort of a more modern subdivision where all the houses are, are cookie cutter, most of these houses are, are quite uniquely built. They're all a little bit different, and having been here for a hundred years, even if there were two that started off the same, you know, over time, all the different owners who have had them over the years will have done their own sort of modifications to them, and they'll end up being, you know, very different in that amount of time. All right, so almost up at DuPont. Over on the left, we're going past uh, an old fire hall that's still operating, fire hall number 344. I guess originally, the original sign says fire station number 23. They've been renumbered. And I'm sure that's related to the amalgamation of the different boroughs of Toronto. I know that 344, the three, indicates you know, what part of the city it's located in. All right. So yeah, almost that back at DuPont, ready to keep going. And let's just double check, see what the street that we're going to for our final portion of the, well not final portion, but we're going all the way over to Huron Street. All right, so I'll get on back on the bike and we'll go in the east direction here along DuPont for the final, our final segment here on DuPont. And I guess I really just have two more turns left to make. And if I'm able to make those, then I'm able to successfully complete this video. All along I've been so worried that I'll make a wrong turn or something. Cause the thing is with a with a Strava Arter, you know, what I'm doing here, there's no eraser. So if you go the wrong way and you draw an extra line or you know you go an extra block or something and you get things a little bit off, well, it's gonna be a little bit off. There's no there's no fixing it. Well, yeah, if I can make these last two turns correctly, then we successfully have completed our mission. So that was Fedina Road that we just went past there. This one here is Madison Avenue. And the one after that is called Huron. So I'll turn to the right after this bus gets out of our way. I guess it's a red light, so we'll have to wait for that to turn green first before the other vehicles will clear out of there. Just gonna have a quick sip of water while we're waiting. This ride certainly hasn't been a, has not been a uh, serious exercise for me. It hasn't been very physically exerting. And that's because I'm always stopping and getting off and walking and <laughs> But it's kind of been a men mental challenge because like I said, it's, it's all about making sure you make the right turns at the right times. And the pressure's on the further you go because if you mess up at the very beginning, you can just start over again. But after you've been out going for 45 minutes or so, it's 
it would be pretty disappointing to need to start over again and I probably wouldn't do it. I would just, you know, stick with my nearly perfect drawing, but like I said, I think I'm on the right track and now we'll get to see all those letters or these uh, numer numerals, those numbers getting completed. So yeah, this is Huron Street that we're on and the, the school that's over on the left coming up is called Huron Street Public School, which is a junior public school. In the schoolyard, there's a very large tree that I recently discovered. It's certainly more than 100 years old. It's a silver maple tree. But based on the diameter of the trunk, I think it must be around 200 years old, but everything that I've read about it says it's younger than I, than I think. All right, so we're at a street called Lother. And the nice thing about this too is that the last segment of the ride that I'll be doing will be along bike lanes, or at least almost the entire thing will be along bike lanes. Unfortunately, the portion of Bloor up ahead, which spans from Spadina Avenue to Avenue Road, currently is, uh, they're replacing the water main underneath of the street, they're rebuilding, reconstructing the road which means there's a lot of construction right now and the bike lane is kind of closed. All right, final turn, turning to the right and gonna start completing that first or that last of the four zeros. So yeah, right now it looks like I'm in a bike lane but this is actually the regular live traffic lane. That vehicle didn't look like it was going to stop, so I, of course, had to slow down. All right, Bloor and Spadina. And now that construction's finished, so the rest of the way we should have a, a nice bike lane to take us all the way to, all the way back to Lansdowne. All right, we're at Walmer Road here. Gonna wait our turn to cross. And here we are at Brunswick Avenue, which I did not ride on in this video, but it's a place that I would like to show sometime this summer because it received a Contraflow bike lane last summer, which is really useful because it was, it was a, one of those one ways it's reversing. And it's a really nice sort of location. It's sort of halfway between uh, Spadina and Bathurst Street. Just a north-south street that goes pretty far. But with it being those reversing one ways, you really couldn't ride your bike on it. And really the one ways throughout these neighborhoods here are really a maze. They're really designed to, to discourage people from driving through the neighborhoods because the local residents don't want people driving on their streets. So to get through these neighborhoods, you're really you know, you're, you're, you're weaving and you're zigzagging amongst different streets to be able to get through. So a contraflow on a street like Brunswick makes a lot of sense. All right, here I am at Bathurst Street. So we finished our first, our last of the 
four zeros has now been completed. And now I'll work on the next segment. While I'm at this traffic light, I'm just gonna look at my Strava results so that I can see what you guys can see. Oh my goodness, I'm just seeing that my <laughs> that I somehow paused my Strava along the way, which I absolutely hate. But luckily I have been recording this also on <laughs> my Garmin GPS. So hopefully I'll be able to get the GPX data from that instead. I find that Strava does that, it pauses itself too easily, like, I guess there is an auto pause, but I guess I'm pretty bad at using the app because I will accidentally, you know, tap the wrong thing. Geez, that's not good. Yellow light here at Palmerston Avenue. Let me just double check and make sure my Garmin GPS is actually recording still. Because if it's not, this video is all for nothing. Looks like it is. All right, I'll leave that going. <laughs> so yeah, this is the area of Bluery here that we're on is known as Koreatown. So you'll notice a number of businesses that have Korean writing on them. If you're a fan of the show Kim's Convenience, which is set in Toronto, it's about a Korean-Canadian family that owns a convenience store in Toronto. Their convenience store is not located in Koreatown. It's actually located in on Queen Street East, down in the Moss Park neighborhood. But there are some episodes where they, you know, have have uh, locations that they'll... Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Where they have some locations, uh, you know, where they'll, where they'll go to a restaurant or a store or a movie theater or something. And it'll be somewhere else around the city. I found that show really funny. It's got some good comedy in it, but it's also really fun for me just seeing and recognizing the places around Toronto they show in the show. Unfortunately, that show got cancelled recently. Kind of unexpectedly. It was seemed like a really popular, successful show. But I guess the the creators of it just decided that they wanted to move on and do do something else, which I would guess they were just they probably asked for for more money than the the the, uh, the broadcasters were willing to to pay. That's just my speculation. So yeah, the show kind of you know the the season. Whoa, whoa. Should have rung my bell, but that guy should have not walked out into a an active travel lane like that either. Good thing my brakes work. But yeah, just to finish what I was saying, Kim's convenience. The season just ended the way that a season would end. There was sort of a cliffhanger, and there was sort of, you know, the things that would make you excited about the next season and. There is going to be no next season. All right, so here we are at Shaw Street, which is a street that has one of those Contraflow bike lanes that I was talking about that Brunswick Street got last year. Shaw Street got its Contraflow bike lane back in, I think, 2013. It's certainly not new. I think it was the first of its kind in in Toronto and probably the first of its kind in Ontario. Could be wrong about that. But yeah, if you're not familiar, a Contraflow bike lane is a bike lane that's installed on a 
one-way street, which allows bikes to go in the opposite direction of all the other vehicles. So, you know, if it's a northbound one-way, the bikes are allowed to go southbound. They have their own little lane for that. So it turns a one-way into a two-way. And it's really helpful for those reversing one-way streets because the bikes are able to continuously go through where the cars are not, so it still serves the purpose of the keeping the traffic from going through the neighborhood that the r local residents wanted to avoid in the first place. So you, here we are at Ossington Avenue, and we'll be continuing our way in the west direction. Over on the left is uh, Long and McQuaid Musical Instruments. Which has, I think, a total of four different storefronts along there. So if you, you know, want to go a certain type of musical instrument, you have to look at the fronts of the stores to make sure you're in the right store, because there's like a woodwinds instrument or a, a band's instrument. There's guitars, there's drums, there's pro audio. There's all different sort of, it's not one big store. It's really these sort of independent stores that are all sort of, you know, related and affiliated with one another, but they're spread out like that. And yeah, I guess I should mention, once we got past Shaw, this is all new bike lanes that were installed last year towards the end of the summer in July or August. Which really does make getting to the West End a lot more convenient and a lot more safe. <laughs> and here we are at Havelock Street. My only main criticism of these bike lanes is that they're pretty narrow. I mean, it's it's sort of the, the standard that the city builds them to, but, and, and I mean, really, it's, it's a compromise to even get bike lanes at all, but it really would, would be nice if the bike lanes were, you know, another meter or another half meter wider, because it would allow you to be able to, you know, pass other people or other people to pass you, because there are people of different, you know, ages and abilities who are using these bike lanes and you do tend to get stuck behind somebody or somebody gets stuck behind you. And that's one of the things I love about the University Avenue bike lanes. They're really nice and wide. They took pretty much a whole vehicle traffic lane, turned it into a bike lane, and uh, just made it so great. All right, so here we are at Dufferin Street. And this is where I made my first left turn onto uh, onto Bluer, the one that I didn't do so well. And that means that all my zeros are now complete and all that's left is to finish that last segment of the number three. So as soon as this turns green, I'll continue my way in the west direction and we'll ride the lens down to finish off this video. There's a pedestrian crossing here. We'll wait for our turn to cross. This area of Bloor is known as the Bloorerdale Village. Someone's trying to turn left there, but there's a left turn restriction in place. You're not allowed to turn there. That, that's why that person was 
was honking, it's not because they were impatient. They're actually, the person was actually breaking the rules. So here is the Lansdowne intersection. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed joining me on this narrated tour. Thanks for 30,000 subscribers and thanks for watching.